so uh, this 80-year-old guy is sitting on the park bench and he's crying. He's crying. So the guy goes out to me. He says, can I help you? Is there something wrong? He says, no, it's OK. He says, he says, I'm 80 years old. He says, I'm married to a woman well half my age. She's beautiful. She's a supermodel. We make love four times a day. She cooks. She cleans. She treats me like a king. He says, what are you crying for? He says, I don't know where I live. <laughs> I guess I have to edit that one out. <laughs> okay, we'll begin with the prayer. Uh, we won't, we're not going to say a Hail Mary for the Yankees. Uh, in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. Gracious God, be with us and bless us. Illumine our minds, inflame our hearts, and direct our wills. Strengthen us, sustain us, grant us wisdom, power, every good gift, help us to know your will, and by your divine grace, may it be accomplished for your glory, by your grace, for our good, and the good of this world. And we offer you this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Seat of wisdom, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, it says in the booklet I'm going to be speaking about being witnesses. I changed my talk. <laughs> but in one sense, it, it does, it will relate. But we'll just begin with a little something. Um, Dominus vobiscum. Just gave your age away. <laughs> just gave your age away. I think it's been maybe around five years, maybe more, that we had the new translation of the Mass. And the Mass, as you know, was uh, translated uh, when, uh, after the Council. But um, whether it was done hastily or it was done with a different perspective, but anyway, a few years ago, we came out with a new translation. And we returned to the more correct Latin, Dominus, which is Lord, vobis cum, be with you, et cum spiritu, to and with your spirit. And there are other translations or other words which were changed, especially for the, for the laity, uh, for those who are in the congregation. For the priests, we had to have a little bit more tongue twisters with certain things. And, uh, but the orations of the Mass, I believe, are much more beautiful. Uh, again, they were more uh, adhering more to a literal translation of the original Latin, because, you know, when anything official is published in Rome, it's done first in Latin, and then that is translated into different languages. So the Mass, which you celebrate today, um, with the orations and the like, um, are, we might sort of say, more faithful translations, okay? Not that the other was off, but it was not as faithful as it could be. I say this is because in the Creed, we have some things like, um, uh, now we have to sort of say, uh, consubstantial with the Father, right? Con or cum is with, sub is under, stasis, which is stand, so something which is the sort of the stuff underneath, meaning the, that Jesus and the Father and the Spirit are made of the same stuff. You know, they, they are the same thing. Now, if you have dentures, consubstantiation can be a little bit, you know, <laughs> consubstantial, you have a little slip with those things, but uh, people in Rome don't worry about that. Um, now we say made incarnate of the Blessed Virgin Mary, incarnate, carnis, huh? carne, chili, chili con carne, carnis is, is flesh. So uh, the, the, the God, God is in flesh, the incarnation. But there's also one that was, uh, people sort of say, you know, I think they're trying to sell new books, all these things. Why, why do I have to make these little, what's the difference? It's seen and unseen. And now it's visible and invisible. I mean, what's, you know, what's the difference? Big difference. Okay, let me, this works better over here. Let's see, here. Okay, very good. Now, I want everyone to close your eyes. I can see you, so you can't see. You close your eyes. I see your eyes are open. There you go. Close your eyes. I see your eyes. Okay. Okay, you can open them now. 
Now, am I invisible or am I unseen? <laughs> the church says that the Latin visibilium et invisibilium, and it's important. And it's important for the church to be faithful and to, to, to take the, to the exact theological words, because if you, if, you, if you start fooling around with this, when you, once you start fooling around with theology, even if it sort of doesn't make a difference to me, if it makes a big difference. Some of you, a number of you, do carpentry and, and framing houses or whatever you do, homes, and you know you've got to square things off on the bottom. If you're a quarter of an inch off here, you're four inches off up there. Then you're four feet off. Then you're four miles off. So you have to square everything off. So the church tells us that there are things that God created everything visible and invisible. Invisible, like heaven, purgatory, hell, angels, faithful, and fallen. I want to speak today about spiritual authority. I don't want anyone coming home and saying, I heard this priest talk about, you know, uh, about demons and about the devil and about exorcism. That's not really what I'm talking about, although it is related. If we want to connect it to this, to about being a witness, and Mr. Staples, who gave a beautiful talk, is that, you know, if we're not taking care of our own home, you know, the home's going to fall apart. And this is one of the things, Though you, those of you who are homeowners, you know that it's, it's, it's a lot of, it's a hassle. Some people even don't want to have their own home is because they don't want to take care of the lawn and they don't want to take care of the roof and they don't want to take care of this. But if you have something to take care of, you have to take care of it and it's your business to take care of it. Now, if you consider yourself as a home, actually it's a temple, but if you want to even consider it a principality, a territory, it's, it, this is something that has been entrusted to you, a castle. Use the image you want, but the point being is, is that something has been given to us. Not simply just something visible, like a body, but something invisible, like a soul. And I believe it's very, very important that we have a good understanding of what's going on in our lives, in the lives of the world. Mr. Staples just finished his talk, speak, telling that, that things are, 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 are in a downspin. And, and, and it seems that even good people are, are going from good to bad to worse. And so how do we not simply just protect ourselves? We're not simply just talking about spiritual warfare, although it's related. But how do we become the people that we're called to be if we don't necessarily know what's going on? Can you imagine walking down the street with a few of the guys and you're walking down there and all of a sudden, psh, you know, and you know, someone falls over, ow, what's that? Oh, I got shot. And then, uh, psh, what's that? Oh, it's a landmine. And, and you're walking and then someone runs out and sort of, what are you guys doing? He says, what? We're walking. He says, there's a war going on. War going on? Where? There's a war going on. Are you kidding? Brothers, there's a war going on. There's a war going on. Now, am I going to sort of say that that the devil is behind every door? No. But he's behind every other door. Am I going to, is this talk about that we have to blame the devil on all of our problems? No. But if we don't necessarily see that there's someone who's exacerbating and irritating and, and, and making things worse, then you, you, you have your head in the, either in the clouds or in the sand. You have a bale of hay and you have a candle. Dry hay, straw, two different things for those of you who are farmers. And you, if, you, if you, they go too close to one another, the fire begins. So whether it's you with the computer or you with the this or you with the that, whatever the thing is, the person, the place, or the thing is, when you get these two things, you're going, to have to, you're going to have a problem. Don't blame the devil for that. Blame the devil for...
whether he's two feet away or two miles away or 200 miles away, when there's something bad going on, he's around. What just happened in Las Vegas, it's not simply just a person having a bad day. There's something sinister about this, and we simply just like to say, oh, well, he was crazy. Oh, he had mental illness. Now everyone's schizophrenic. He's schizophrenic. Well, well if this is schizophrenia, well, why, doesn't, why doesn't the mind tell, go, go, go tickle that person. <laughs> go tickle them. Go tickle everybody. Then tickle yourself. <laughs> okay, guy's schizophrenic. What's with killing everybody and then shooting yourself? Why is it always death? Why don't we see the opposite? If it's, if it's mental, if it's psychological. I'm not saying that this man did not have problems. There was, there was something there. There was a wound there. But the question is, was the wound infected? And maybe he tried to do even his best to somehow to get this anger that he had, this vengeance, this rage, to, but, but he had no... He had no resources. He had no grace in him. He was, he, was, he was a victim, in some sense, of the enemy. Are we going to find ourselves in that situation, not necessarily doing anything like that, but something like that on a much smaller stage or scale? Some of you get the Magnificat, which is a nice little um, a book, uh, uh, has the daily readings in it. Today in the readings, um, uh, I had Mass this morning, many of you didn't because you have the Vigil Mass. This was the reading today from the Gospel of Luke. Jesus said to his apostles, I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before others, the Son of Man will acknowledge before the angels of God. But whoever denies me before others will be denied before the angels of God. Angels of God. Disembodied spirits of pure intelligence and pure will. They exist. If you don't think that they exist, and you don't believe that they exist, you're not Catholic. You're not Catholic. When a church celebrates a feast day, it's not celebrating a feast day of some, some, something. It's a reality. And so angels exist. Faithful angels, and there are fallen angels. The scriptures give not a blow-by-blow blow account. Some of it is symbolic, but it's also real. Apparently, one-third, was it exactly one-third? Who cares? One-third of these angels fell. Theologians surmise that the reason why Lucifer rejected God and went against him is because it was revealed that God would become a human being. Now, when you're an angel, your pure intelligence and your pure will, for you to take on stuff and flesh and things like that is like someone coming to you and sort of saying, you know what? Uh, you see that slug over there? That is God, okay? And you're going to have to kneel down and worship the slug God. You sort of say, I'm not going to worship any slug God. Are you out of your mind? Do you know that we have more in common with slugs than God has in common with us? Slugs are made of stuff. <laughs> Talk about consubstantial. They have eyes or something. How they get around somewhere, they or they poop, I don't know what they do, but whatever they do, it's basically, it's a, it's a, it's a living, animate organism, and it has something that we have more in common with a slug than God has with us. God didn't become an angel, God became a human being, and Lucifer said, that's too much, I'm not going there, and for a second, him and the third rejected it. And that's what we're dealing with here. Is there a demon behind every door? No. But behind every other door? Maybe. One of the reflections from the Magnificat, from Father Gerald Van, Dominican friar. The heart of man is an abyss. There is room in it for infinity because in it there is an infinity of desire. And it cannot remain empty. The stark horror of an alien evil will inhabit it if it is not filled by the limitless ocean of the goodness of God. I'm going to say it again. The stark horror of an alien evil will inhabit it if it is not filled by the limitless ocean of the goodness of God. He continues. There is no reason to suppose that the serpent of Eden 
does not refer to an evil entity outside of humanity. There is every reason to suppose that it does. And Catholic teaching does, in fact, tell us of spirits greater than man, intermediaries, therefore, between him and God, someone who fell before him, and so instead of filling their appointed place in the harmony of creation, turned their gigantic power to the task of destroying it. Now, if you knew that there was an intelligent person with a lot of resources that really wanted you, he wanted your life, he wanted your wife, he wanted your kids, he wanted the people in your life, if you're not married, that are important to you, if you're widowed, whomever, they, they are, they, you have an enemy, you have a bullseye on your forehead or on your back. If you knew that, you think that you would be a little bit careful. But we don't go there. We don't think of this. We try to deal with this and abortion and the, and the whole gay thing and the whole marriage thing and this and that. We sort of say, well, you know, it's just, you know, this is sort of just sociological. There's something behind this whole thing. I'm not exonerating human beings by no means. They could have their own wounds. I'm saying that these wounds can get gravely infected. Why do I bring this subject up is because I was ordained in 1984. Maybe it was five years ago, I had a, a sort of a little bit of a revelation in my life. Came from when I was in Manhattan hearing confessions. The young boy came to me from confession and he started growling. Being from Brooklyn, I'm like, what's that? <laughs> We got Ajita. <laughs> so I, looking at him, and I'm trying to figure out what's going on, and I take out my crucifix. He's like. Ugh. I says, kiss the cross. I says, kiss the cross. That night somewhat changed my life. I don't want to make it overly dramatic. But anyway, I, I actually spoke with the boy later on. And he told me that he believed he was possessed. He was trying to go to the bishop, and he wasn't getting much help. I won't name the diocese that he was in, although there's plenty of dioceses which he would have the same difficulty. And uh, not this diocese, actually, interestingly enough. Uh, bishop, bishop Caggiano and I worked together on a particular case. So he, he um, and I told him, I said, you know what, I'm, I'm, I will stick by you with this, uh, and I'll try to help you. So I had to, so I did some reading. Went to a workshop out in Chicago that brought me to speaking to the bishop where I was in Newark. And then by his sponsorship, I went to the Pope Leo XIII Institute for, the, for, um, for priests who are involved in this ministry. And since then, I've been involved in this ministry, which I call it's a ministry of deliverance. I don't want to use the word exorcism because it, it's, uh, it gives ideas which are not helpful. Spiritual liberation. And I find it fruitful because there's so many people that appear to have problems. Now, one thing I have to say this. Demonic possession, whereas it says that a heart that's a lim it's not filled by a limitless notion of good, uh, the, the, the sock horror of an alien evil will inhabit if it is not filled... In terms of a person being totally possessed, it's, they're rare in the sense that you don't see them much because they're not sort of walking over to the rectory, ringing the bell and saying, can you please help me? Unless their, fa their family members are dragging them, which is rare. I would have to say that demonic possession is, using this phrase rare, is, is rare. However, demonic obsession and oppression is more frequent than I thought. And temptation? That's our group here. That's ubiquitous. That's all over. 
So the question is, where does this whole area come into your life? Are you, you, you waiting to, to hear voices? And plenty of people do. Are you waiting to feel some type of twitches? Or your arm moving when you don't want it to move? Or, other in, in, or having horrid dreams? Or a number of things? No, don't necessarily wait for that. That will come if you don't take care of the temptations. Now some things were helpful to know. These evil entities, these fallen angels, they are afraid of you. Keep this in mind. They are afraid of you. Why are they afraid of you? To tell you the truth, if you're not baptized, they're not that afraid. If you are baptized, they're afraid. Why? Is because in baptism you have conformed, you're, you're united to the body of Christ. Which means that when they see you, they see Christ. I am the vine, you are the branches. Mr. Staples talked about the cutting the finger off of the hand. When he, sees, when he sees us, a baptized, he sees Christ. If Christ is the king, we would be the king's son, we're the prince. And you know what? You don't need to, uh, if you're an enemy of the, of, of, of the prince, you're an enemy of the king. So these things are afraid of you. Now this is where Hollywood has it all wrong. Hollywood wants us to be afraid of demons and not afraid of sin. And many of the people that I speak with, because much of the work that I do is not necessarily praying over people and casting things out, although that's sort of done at some particular point, but much of the work is laying the foundation for the person to come to realize, do you know who you are? Do you know who you are? Because if you don't know who you are, these things are going to run you ragged. They're going to do whatever they want to do. They're going to take over your castle. And then when you go over, when they're running around and swinging from the chandeliers, and, and, and you know, you're going to say, um, excuse me, do you think you might be able to um, leave? Uh, do you think? No? Oh, OK. I guess I'm... You have to realize who you are to them. You are Jesus Christ. Now. If you're not in the state of grace, I mean, baptism doesn't cover everything, but it does cover a lot. This is why it's very, very important that people get baptized. Even you, I know some of you are very upset it's because your grandchildren or whomever are not baptized. Baptism is important because if there's no name on the mailbox, they're going to go in the house. Not automatically, because these things happen as they happen. Put it this way, if your car is out there and you left, a lot, you left the door open, does it mean that someone is going to take the car? Uh, no. Do you have a greater chance of someone taking a car? Yes. I live in Harlem. The ratio goes up a little bit with this thing here, okay? <laughs> so, okay. But if there's no name on the mailbox, they're right in there. Matter of fact, I was having a prayer with this woman, and they were from another country. I don't want to get very specific at all, but they were from another country, Catholic country. And, um, and uh, so I was trying to get her to, to for her to bone up and, and stand up and, 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 and tell these things to get out of her head. Because they were saying obscene things at inappropriate times, things that she would never even think about, which is an indication that something's there. So I told her, so, you know, say in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And she said that. I said, say, by the authority of my baptism. She goes, by the authority of my baptism. <laughs> So I look at the husband, and I said, is she baptized? He says, yeah. <laughs> he says, the other priest we went to, she did the same thing when he mentioned baptism. I said, well, what did the priest say? He says, well, he didn't know. You know. I said, well, what if she wasn't baptized validly? He says, we said the same thing to him. I said, what did he say? He, he got angry with us. He says, no, the baptism is valid. Don't doubt the baptism. I'm saying, what if she wasn't baptized validly? He says, so I get water. She's still laughing. <laughs> I says, if you have not been baptized, I baptize you in the name of the Father, <laughs> and the Son, <laughs> and the Holy Baptism. 
One of the best ways of, of preventing yourself from the enemy is confession. And this is why it's, this is why everyone's wounded, everyone's limping, everyone's dying, everyone's, marriages are dying, friendships are dying, everything's, everything's, why? They don't go to confession. Don't go to confession. And sometimes the church doesn't really help with this. You know, yeah, we have confessions are uh, every third Tuesday at uh, 2.30 to 2.40. Uh, you know, and it's exact time. It's like, who, who, who's, who's awake at that time? Who, who goes anywhere at that time? Yes, and 2.30, uh, it's, I know they're working hard and they're running from pillar to post. I, I realize that. But my point is this. Confession is better than any exorcism. Exorcism is only is simply a sacramental of the church. Uh, confession is a sacrament of the church. And this is why the enemy does not want people to attend, uh, to, uh, attend the sacraments. This is why the church says to go to church, go to mass every Sunday. Not when you want it, every Sunday. Why? Is because you don't go once, amen. If you don't go once, you're going to put it off and sort of say, well, it's not that important. The enemy sees infidelity. Now, if you, or if you call me up because you have squirrels, and I call them squirrels because it helps people to get them, they're not so nervous. So I said, I think you have some squirrels. Excuse me? It's squirrels. <laughs> now, if you call me up and you come into my office and sort of say, Father, you know, I have some, I said, you got squirrels. Okay, there it goes. So what is the first question I ask the person? If you had squirrels in your house and I show up, what's the first person I'm going to, I'm going to ask you? Where, how did they get in? How did they get in? It's an obvious question if you have squirrels in the house. And if you say, well, I really don't know. <clears throat> you know so let's walk around and I'll show you. So go around, listen, you always keep this garage door open? Well, you know, sometimes I, you know, I think it gets the air out. The, you know, oh, yeah, okay, keep your garage door closed. What's this back door? What is, what is it? Is this broken or this? You have, to lock, you have to keep that closed. Oh, okay, yeah, great. Okay. <laughs> What's with, the, what's with the tree limbs hanging on top of your roof? Look at this. This is the go down here. They walk around. They run in. See the soffit over there? See it's broken? Okay. They're, they're climbing in there. Oh. I'm not going to fix your house, baby. You do it. You have to fix your house. You have to close off all of the ways. And don't think the garage door is the way it gets in. It may get in the little crack. So may, matter of fact, I want to say, well, I don't, I don't really don't go to church every Sunday. When the enemy sees an entry, it will go in. Once again, it's not definitive. It goes in wherever, wherever there's, whoever, whoever. But my point is this. It doesn't have to be a grave sin. Now, it is true that when they see something very, very dark, they're interested in it. Do you ever notice, uh, like, uh, uh, nighttime is always a thing of, uh, uh, this is why some people get attacked at night in their bed. It's dark. They like darkness. Do you ever see people that are into uh, the occult or, or um, uh, whatever, they wear dark clothing, black, black fingernails, black lipstick, black that? They like black. They like, they like the darkness. I have to admit it. They like the darkness. They dwell in darkness. They're attracted to darkness. Just like a moth is attracted to the light on your porch, moths go around and they're attracted to the light like this. These things are attracted to darkness. They're attracted to darkness. And it's not in a light bulb, it's in a body. It's you, and it's me. And if there's a dark place in me, they're attracted to it. They say, hmm, what's that? You know, you go to the doctor, and you got some tumor, you got something like this, and what do they do? They take your x-ray, they take this, whatever thing, they put you through, see, see this dark area here? That's, that's the problem, right here. See this dark area here? That's the problem. The enemy sees us x-ray is able to sort of see our dark area. It doesn't necessarily mean that one really has a deeply ensconced in sin, although this gets their intention. You're really into pornography, they're there. You're really into gambling, they're there. Drug abuse, drinking, violence, you name it. Even anger and anxiety. You don't control your anger, you don't control your anxiety, you don't control your fears, you just sort of, you're just fearful all the time, you're angry all the time, you're lustful all the time, they are very, very interested in it. Does that mean they're definitely going to show up? No, I can't say that. But I'm just telling you that this attracts the enemy. And this is why this, the sacraments and prayer are, are important. Reading the Word of God, reflecting on the Word of God, the rosary, the typical things. You know one thing I've learned in these five years? 
not that I never doubted it, but everything that the church teaches is true. It, it's, it's simple as that. Everything the church teaches, now, it's more than true, meaning, just like if, if I was a painter and I painted, let's say, a, a scene from, uh, from, let's say, heaven. I have angels and I have clouds and this and that. Even if it was, I was a fantastic painter, and you would sort of say, wow, that's amazing. That's, heaven's much more beautiful than that. If I did hell, hell is worse than that. Angels, the faithful, are beyond our imagination. St. Thomas Aquinas says, I don't know how he gets this, but every angel has, is his own species. And demons are as more frightful as any could imagine. But not frightful in the sense, not for a person who's bathed in light. They don't like light. So this is okay. You're the squirrel and you're there and you're on this a cul-de-sac of some street. Okay, there's a, how, two houses, but only one is a home. Two houses, only one is a home. Well, this one's a, the house is a home, but really it's just, there's a person isolated in there. They don't turn the lights on. The tree limbs are the, 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 and okay. So now you see this, you see the squirrel and you're looking at this one. The lights are on, people are talking, people are laughing. The lawn is, the lawn is mowed, the tree is trimmed, the windows are washed, everything's closed, everything's tight, everything's happy. You're a squirrel. Which one, you want, which one are you gonna go into? Which one? The dark one. You don't want to go into it because they're going to see you. These things do not want to be seen. Why? They are afraid of you. They're afraid of us. Why? Is because God did not become an angel. He became a human. He became one of us. And when he sees us, it reminds him of, 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 of him. But we... We're like the lady, the typical thing of the, you know, the, you know, the mouse runs along the floorboard and the lady, eek, a mouse, you know, you jump on the table. Well, that's okay for a lady with a mouse, but we can't do this, and especially with men, we have to sort of say, no way. That mouse has power over me. How is it possible that that mouse has power over me? It's because of my fear, not because of the reality. We can't have any fear of these things. Are you kidding? When, when hunters go out and they're hunting and they're in this, this stand, are they quiet because they're afraid of the deer or the bear? Or they're quiet because they're afraid of them. No, they're quiet is because the animals are afraid of them. That's why the animals scurry. That's why the squirrels hide. That's why they, that's why they stand still when there's someone. And we walk in, oh, there's nothing here, nothing here. He didn't see us. They hide because they're afraid of being, they want to be seen as you want to be seen naked and walking around, walking around here without your clothes on. That's as much as these demons want to be seen. No wonder they're quiet. No wonder they stay unseen. And quite frankly, even what are called manifestations when a person begins to sh sh shake and this and that, that's actually not a bad thing. Matter of fact, when I pray with someone, I go fishing to sort of see what's on there. You know, you sort of stick this thing. You, know? you see, it's them reacting to the light. You ever see that this happens in shrines, like Lourdes, the Fatima, or Medjugorje? You'll see people start manifesting is because, the, or before the Blessed Sacrament, they'll start manifesting is because the, because of the light. They don't like the light. So, brothers, this is this is we we have to recognize that who we are. Who are you? Okay, Christ is the king, I'm the prince, but I'm in charge of this castle. Okay, now I have to maintain this castle. But if, but if I don't know I'm the king's son, if I have that Alzheimer's, like that old man on the thing, and sort of say, I don't know where I live, but if you don't know who you are, these things are going to run rampant all over your life. You're going to be subject to, to, to the same old sins you had since your teenagers, and you're, you're 70, you're 80 years old, you sort of say, what's going on? I go to Mass every day. I say my rosary every day. Gee, I must be not be praying enough. Well, maybe there's something more. Maybe your wound is infected. But it begins by recognizing who you are. 
So all of a sudden, you're walking around your castle, you got your flip-flops on, you know, you got your gym shorts on, and your, you know, your guinea t-shirt, or whatever they call them, and, you know, <laughs> I'm Italian, leave it alone, okay? Okay. So, so you're walking around, you have your baseball cap on, Yankee cap, uh, bike on backwards, <laughs> shut up. And, and these people are swinging from chandeliers, and who knows what they're doing, they're writing graffiti, they're, they're making your life miserable. And someone comes over to you and says, well, why, why do you allow this thing to go on? Well, I tried, I don't know, I, you know, I, I tried. Hold it. Oh, isn't your father the king? What? Huh? Isn't your father the king? Your father is the king. My father's the king? Yes. You're a prince. What are you doing walking around? The Put the baseball cap on right. I'll lift you to wear it. What are you dressed like that for? What are you walking around here like that for? Get upstairs. Put the crown on your head. Take the scepter in your hand. Come down there and tell them to get the hell out. That's what you do. Because they, they, they want, they work on our mind. This is a very important teaching. I don't have too much time. Very, very important. Worth the price of admission. <laughs> when you were young, your father and your mother said, don't do that. They never said, don't think that. It all begins here, brothers. When you commit a sin, it all begins with an idea. 9-11 started with an idea. It might have been one of the terrorists. It might have been one of the ladies serving tea at their table in one of their hideaway places, and who knows where they were. And she says, oh, you know what? Why don't you get the plane and put it in the, you go in, in, in a building? And they're like, what do you think? <laughs> yeah. It all begins with an idea. Now, what if an idea comes to your head? Well, go check it out a bit. You know, go check it out. Let's go. So you get online or you go on HBO, whatever, whatever you do. Well, who knows? You, you, you just, it's an idea. Oh, let's see. Yeah. And they play games with you, too. I'm just checking weather. I'm just checking this. See, it's a game. But if you don't know that, you're the fool. So replace the revolving door in your forehead, which allows any thought in, and replace it with a, big do with a door, a little window, and a big lock. And do it today. And start examining what thoughts come to your mind. If you had, I don't know, I've never been to anyone's house here, but I know that none of you live with a revolving door in your house. But I suspect that 99% of you have a revolving door in your forehead. So re change the door. And when, it, when something comes to your head, you have to tell it that you cannot come in. Now, one thing that I've learned, a few things that I've learned about these things over the years, <laughs> five years, big deal. You ever hear the saying, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king? Ever heard that? I'm the one-eyed guy in, in terms of this. <laughs> I'm learning every day. I'm learning every day. These things are very juridical. They're very juridical. They're very well aware of rights. Now remember, the hierarchy, they came from a hierarchy, they fell. If you're a colonel in heaven, you're a colonel in hell. If you're a private in heaven, you're a private in hell. There's a hierarchy. They hate one another. There's no, there's no compassion, no love. They hate one another, but they have to work together. They have to work together. And they work out of fear, the top-down fear. I'm, I'm, I'm not afraid of the guy in front of me. He's afraid. It's all fear. So they're very well aware of rights. They will, if you're in the army, when you walk in, you see the, the sorry, they salute, you salute. You don't even, whether you like the guy or not, you salute. They salute to the person above them. So therefore, they're very well aware of rights. They don't belong in you, unless you gave them the right. And that's where you have to go to confession and confess. You might have given them the right, or gave them the idea that you have the right. Until you rebuke it and sort of say, I will not, this is a sin, and I will not do this. I rebuke this sin, and I reject this sin. If you don't say that with your lips, then they're sort of just thinking, well, this guy's this guy blowing steam. So you have to say it, and they know it, and they don't want you to say it. They're very well aware of rights and authority. One thing I've learned in this ministry, it's not so much about power. Angels... They have one demon could destroy the world, but God clips their wings. He doesn't allow that. If I brought a horse in here, I enjoy riding, well, I haven't ridden in a while, but Brooklyn boy rides horses. But anyway, <laughs> if I brought a horse in here and you couldn't get out of the room, 
That horse could kill all of you. That horse could kill all of you if it understood that it had the, the, the it has a physical capacity to do it, kicking, 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 everyone. It just doesn't have its act together to be able to do it, and so you hold it by the halter, and you sort of say, yeah, stay, stay right here, okay. These things have power, but they do not have authority. All of you, by virtue of your baptism, have the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. Curiously enough, if you have children, you have authority over demons over your children. So if you have problems with your kid and they're taking drugs or they're doing a the pornography, doing something, and you think you could actually lay your right hand on their head, which you don't, you, none of you have the right to do this over anyone. Priest does, by ordination. The father can lay it on his head and says, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command you, spirit of whatever, to get out of my son, get in my daughter. Men, of, you have the right over your children. God the Father gives you authority. They don't like that. They know authority. Power, it's not about power. It's about authority. I was praying over one person one time, and the demon says to me, he says, you don't have much faith. I says, you don't know how little faith I have. Shut up. <laughs> faith. I says, this has nothing to do with faith. It has to do with authority. I come here in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You got it? He went like this. It's authority. Now, is holiness important? Yes. You can't be in a state of grace. Or you can't be walking around and going to them and, and have your scepter and have your hat backwards and the shorts and the flip-flops and sort of say, uh, can you kindly get out? No. But when you know that you're in a state of grace, when you know what's right and you know what's wrong and you know that this thing is, that thing is ruining your life, and to tell you the truth, even if it diminishes your, 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 your fatherhood or your whoever you are, if it diminishes life, the life of Jesus in you, it's, it's affecting your family members. Put it this way. What if I was in secret sin? What if I was in mortal sin? I was in secret sin. You would know. You'd say, oh, he's a great priest. Yeah. I'm not that great, though. And I would have been greater for you, but because of this type, type of thing, the life of Jesus was not able to radiate through me. So they know authority. So this is, you have to remember, you have to, you have to remind them of the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. They also do not like Mary. They hate Mary, and they, they, they don't like Mary. So you remind them of the authority given to the Holy Mother of God. Remind them that of that, too. They need to be reminded. Then you remind them, by I'm also by the authority of my baptism. Okay? Then you tell them, I command you, spirit of... Name the thing. Name it. You're not going to get some type of weird biblical name. Sometimes that happens. But you name the thing. Impurity. Anger. Anxiety. Fear. Jealousy. Rage. Whatever. Name it. You should know what your demon is named. Name it. And then tell them to leave. Now. Now. The reason why you say oh, the name of our Lord Jesus Christ is because if you say Jesus, some of you are Latino or Hispanic, you know a few Jesuses. <laughs> and they're like that. They're like, um, uh, yeah, Jesus. Okay, great. No, 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 no. The Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, okay. Hmm. You say the Lord Jesus Christ. You tell them also to leave now because they're just like adolescent kids. You tell them something, they find a loophole with it. You didn't tell us to leave they, you just told us to leave. We were planning on leaving tomorrow. No, no, no. You have to leave now. Oh. You tell them to leave now. You cannot tell them to go to hell. You don't have that authority. Christ does. But you can tell them to go to the foot of the cross. And to the, beneath the feet of the Holy Mother of God. Just to put salt in their wound. Basically, deliverance is basic torture. To getting these things out. And you tell them that they cannot return. Because if, because if you don't say that, say, what, what are you doing back here? You didn't tell us not to come back. You tell them to, not to come back. You got it? Understand? Yes. So the next time you get that feeling that something's there. Now, some of you get things, and it's, it, you're almost obvious it's demonic. It's unexpected. It's tenacious. It's very vibrant. It's like someone threw a wet towel over your head. That's when you know he's right behind the door. But he may be two miles away or 20 miles away. But at the same time, you state who you are. And you get these things out of your life once and for all. You have been a patsy for 
30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years or more because you don't know who you are. Spiritual authority given to you by your holy baptism. So this is what we, I'm at the end right now, so okay. So this is what we're going to do, we're going to do. And no, last thing. You, while you don't have the right, although a father can do it over his children, no lay person has a right to command a demon out of another person. You could pray to God and ask God, please to help, to help Joe with it. No, no, but, but not in terms of the demon itself. You have no authority to do that. But you know what, guys? You have the authority over yourselves, do you not? You don't call the bishop up and say, can I, can I tell the devil to go to hell? No, you don't do that. That's your job. This is your castle. This is your kingdom. You do it for yourself. Here we go. Repeat after me. First of all, let's get into a spirit of faith and prayer. This is not magic. Let me ask you this. If you have something malign in your life, do you want it out? Yes. Do you want it out now? Yes. Okay, here we go. Repeat after me. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. by the authority given to his holy mother, by the authority of my holy baptism, I command you, I command you spirit, of spirit of impurity, infidelity, infidelity anger, anger, rage, rage jealousy, jealousy, anxiety, anxiety or, any other companion spirits, or any other companion spirits. I command you to leave me now. Leave me now. Go, to the Go to the foot of the cross. Go beneath the holy heel of the Mother of God. And do not return to me. And do not return to me. Amen. Amen.